Hey everybody. Are we live? I see like a twirling thing. I think we're live. Hey, it's Dr. Sarah Gottfried. I'm really excited to be with you. I just wanted to come on because I just met with a group of psychiatrists and midwives and the Integrative Psychiatry Institute and we had such a good conversation about perimenopause and menopause and taking a sexual history, the sexual issues that women face because 43% of us have a problem. And we had a lot of fun talking about estrogen metabolism, hot flashes, night sweats, sleep issues, cortisol. And I just thought, well, maybe I'll go live and just talk about some of these things, see if there's any interest or questions in these particular topics. So if you can see me, please say hi. Let me know where you're from. And I'm still like learning my way around Facebook Live. I'm kind of late to the party. I've been doing the Instagram Lives for a while and we had a problem with our account. I don't know if you noticed that. Craig Diamond, where have you been hiding? Yeah. I, I hear you. I've been hiding. I've been hiding over on Instagram, and I realize that I miss my people over on Facebook, so I'm really happy to be back here. So, one thing I was talking about is um, the vulva <laughs> with this group of psychiatrists and midwives and therapists. And uh, hi, Nancy from Illinois. Hi. Oh, Aaron. Oh, fantastic. How nice to see you. Wait, you're supposed to be off the computer. <laughs> uh, Donna from Wisconsin. Carolyn from Monticello, Arkansas. That's awesome. Happy to see you guys. So, yeah, Aaron was just with me. We were just talking about um, the sex hormone pathway. What can you do to make it better? Aaron, in fact, I can I can follow up with you now. I just sent an email to Integrative Psychiatry Institute, but you had asked about thyroid and maca. Does anyone take maca? Maca has been shown to really help both men and women with libido, and I wonder if any of you take it as an adaptogen. And after I got off the phone with you, the Zoom call, Aaron, the thing I was trying to think of with you, I wanted to go through these steroid pathways that are really complicated biochemistry that'll probably make everyone get off. But the point I wanted to make is that the good pathway with estrogen, which is the 2-hydroxyestrone pathway, that is upregulated. So we upregulate the good pathway with thyroxin. So that was the point I was trying to make to you, that there's this crosstalk between thyroid and estrogen that's really important to know about. Susie from Montreal. Oh my gosh, I love Montreal. Craig Diamond, what happened to the longevity now in women's wellness conferences? Good question. I have no idea. I have no idea. I had a lot of fun at those conferences. Oh my gosh. Uh, David Avocado Wolf. Where is he? I think he's on Instagram too. I don't see him as much. I miss his conferences. Stephanie from Seattle, Washington. Hi, Stephanie. So Greg, Craig takes Black Maca. Okay, what does it do for you, Craig? I'm curious. So I was just looking at the evidence again because we had this clinical rounds with a group of clinicians. And so I was looking at some of the new randomized trials showing that uh, MACA helps women with depression. This is shown in randomized trials. It helps with anxiety. It can stimulate the estrogen pathways, so you have to be a little bit careful with it. It can cause breast tenderness if you get too much of it. And so I like to, to track the estrogen pathways, my patients who are taking maca. And uh, Aaron, you asked about thyroid and maca. I couldn't find a single randomized trial or other study showing that there's a thyroid disruption effect. So we'll have to dig a little deeper on that. But as far as I know, I don't see anything. So Anna from Portland, Oregon. I have a sister named Anna in Portland. Christine from Buffalo, New York. Donna takes maca. It's great in shakes. Yeah, if you like that kind of multi-taste, it's really good in shakes. I like it too. I could probably use one right now. I'm in perimenopause. 
and um, could use a little maca right now, right? It's 5.14 p.m. Pacific time, and it's, it's when I usually have that kind of dip in the day, which means I probably need to go eat a big salad. So some of you are taking maca. Hi, Wayne from Nova Scotia. That's fantastic. I want to visit there someday. Um, I'm curious what questions you guys have. So I have a few Facebook Lives that are coming up. I've got one with my friend, Dr. Dan Monty, which is gonna be next week. So let me get the details here. It's October 14th. I think that's Wednesday. Let me look at the calendar. I think that's Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So that's 12 Pacific. You can translate that into your local time. Yeah, the 14th is a Wednesday. And I'm looking for a title for that. So what do you guys want to hear about? He takes care of both men and women, as I do. We could talk about bioidentical hormones for men or women or both. We could talk about glucose and insulin, fat loss. I'll take off my uh, jacket here and show you my my continuous glucose monitor. I love tracking my glucose, so you might have questions about that. We could talk about immune health. Are you sick of hearing about immune health? I'm curious. We could talk about weight loss. Erin, how long does it take to see a benefit? Do you mean with maca? I notice it right away when I put it in a smoothie, but most of the studies are uh, six weeks. So Megan has a question about collagen supplements. We could definitely talk about that. I'm a fan of collagen. Most of the data on collagen shows that it definitely has a skin effect. The most proven in randomized trial is that it improves elasticity of the skin. But it's not a complete protein. So I like to get more complete protein in my day. Um, so I, I have collagen every one or two days, but I, I don't consider it a complete protein. So Susie, how would a mild traumatic brain injury affect premenopausal hormone levels? That's a good question. Um, Lauren wants to hear about glucose. Hi, Lauren, nice to see you. Okay, good, we're gonna talk about glucose next week. We could talk about it a little bit today too. Carla's very interested in glucose, insulin, and fat loss. Okay, so maybe we'll get into some of that today. Erin with maca. Yeah, so six weeks is usually how long it takes to see an effect, but I, I notice the adaptogenic effects right away. So it raises estradiol levels. Taking maca raises estradiol levels. And those of us who are in perimenopause, the second half of perimenopause, that's a good thing because we could use a little more estradiol. It's really good for the brain helps us with memory, helps us with uh, synaptic function, those connection between the synapses. So let me say a few things about glucose. Donna wants info on the best birth control for young adults. Lori wants to hear about glucose. I'm so excited. Okay. Gosh, I haven't done a Facebook Live in so long. Um, I did them for a while and then I, like the technology was not working for me. So I like begged off of them for a while. And I'm back, and I'll be back next Wednesday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. So let's talk about glucose a little bit, because I feel like, gosh, it took me so long to really understand glucose and insulin. I feel like I've been studying it for like 15, 20 years, and it took so long for me to kind of get the hang of it. So I'm just going to show you. You probably know this already, but with my continuous glucose monitor, I can just do this quick scan and see where I am. So you can see my glucose here is 84. That's pretty good. So I like to hang out in the 80s. Um, I don't like to see a lot of jaggedness. So you can see my, my nice flat line here. And that's what I want to see. I know it doesn't show up that well on the screen. But here, let me go back a little bit further. Uh, so here's the deal. I want my glucose and I want the glucose of my patients to be less than 100. So I set up their continuous glucose monitor to look between 
the target range of 70 to 100. I'm actually happy if it goes down. If it goes down as low as 60, I'm okay with that. Below 60, we need to make sure that there's not these hypoglycemic swings. But what I worry about in terms of gaining fat, especially right at the, the waist, visceral fat, what we worry about is these really jagged peaks and troughs with your glucose. And that's what was happening for me. So I started wearing a continuous glucose monitor about two years ago. And oh my gosh, I would have a banana and my glucose would go to 200. So I think that was a combination of how my gut, my microbiome was dealing with the banana. And it was also stress because we know stress cortisols involved in glucose as well. So Donna, where do I get that glucose monitor? Deborah, nothing I can do to help me lose weight. Do you need a referral to get a glucose monitor from Eliza? So yes and no. So there's two companies that will deal with consumers directly in terms of continuous glucose monitors. One is NutriSense, which I don't know a lot about. And the other is Levels. So you can check out both of those in terms of getting a continuous glucose monitor. When I have a patient, then I'm either gonna order a continuous glucose monitor through their insurance, and the cost is typically about $75 a month. So that's for two monitors because each of these lasts for two weeks. Erin's saying the continuous glucose monitor is a total game changer. The data is so motivating. Yeah, so what's motivating about it? is that you can tell right away what's happening with your glucose. And so you see, for instance, when I ate a sweet potato, my glucose would go up to the diabetes range. And so I was eating this food that I thought was healthy and it wasn't at all, it just wasn't good for me. And it wasn't that I had to cut out all carbs, it was more that I had to pick my carbs much more carefully. So it allowed me to, to get this immediate biofeedback and to really zero in on what was best. And I also found that eating more oil, particularly uh, extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, MCT oil, that really made a difference in terms of helping me with my blood sugar. So you got a few options there. You've got NutriSense, you've got Levels, you could come and see me as a patient. So I'm about to open my practice to new patients. You can go to sarahgottfriedmd.com forward slash patient. I could probably type that in somewhere. Oh, look at that, I could comment right here. So I'll type that in in case any of you wanna sign up. sarahgottfriedmd.com forward slash patient. So that's where you can sign up to get on the notification list. We're about to, to uh, start the application process very soon and what I've found with my patients, you know, some of my patients just can't get it through their insurance for one reason or another. They have an HMO, they have Kaiser, they don't want their insurance to know. Um, and so for those patients, I've got a few pharmacies that are really affordable. In fact, the price per continuous glucose monitor is less than $100. So it gives you so much information. I really find it's valuable. And it's, it's been such a game changer for me. Like I'm looking at my arms right now, they look pretty good. I don't know. Um, but I've lost about 25 pounds of fat over the past year with the focus that I've had on the continuous glucose monitor. And when I'm taking my patients through um, the new diet that's gonna be part of my new book that comes out in a year, I really like for them to have a continuous glucose monitor because it helps us with the weight loss, the fat loss part, and then it really helps us when they start to add back more carbs after they go through this process. So Trish, what can you do about dryness and sleep issues? Oh, this is right up my alley. Lori, I'm waiting patiently. Thank you for waiting. I know it's been a long time. Um, Melinda, I never sleep. It's so daunting. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's go through some different options for sleep. I know all of you know kind of the kindergarten level stuff. I'm not gonna repeat all that. Sleep hygiene for women over the age of 35, 
Try to sleep in a room that's 64 degrees or colder. That really makes a difference in terms of sleep. Makes such a huge difference for me. And during this uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, my husband is home more and he likes it warmer. It's hard, it's really hard. He never watches my Facebook Live so I can complain a little bit about him. We're about to have our, what is it? 17 year wedding anniversary. So, um, you know, you gotta pick your battles, right? Uh, let me know if you guys, if any of you guys have been in a partnership for a long time, let me know how long it's been because you deserve an award. Francesca, hi from Sydney, Australia. Hi, Francesca, happy to see you. Okay, so vasomotor symptoms. Lori mentioned the vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats. I wanna talk about this for a moment because a lot of people think that vasomotor symptoms are just like this nuisance that we could either medicate away with hormone therapy or not. And we actually need to pay more attention to vasomotor symptoms, here's why. So this week, we have the North American Menopause Society meeting. So that's been happening every day. I've been involved in uh, watching this conference and like devouring every morsel that's offered. And there's so much information now about vasomotor symptoms and how it's a predictor of future disease. So it's not just some nuisance symptom to medicate away. It's actually a biomarker, a predictor that we need to pay attention to. What does it predict? It predicts hypertension. It predicts cognitive decline. It predicts cardiovascular disease. It predicts osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures. So I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying it to say, we need to medicate these. So, you know, when the 20% of women in menopause were taking hormones before the year 2000, and then the Women's Health Initiative got published and women were scared to, out of their minds. And so millions stopped taking their, their oral, their um, hormone therapy. And I think there was too much of a pendulum swing. We actually need to get smarter about the use of bioidentical hormones. So that's what I advise. What we know is that if you have these hot flashes and night sweats and it's these vasomotor symptoms, if they're untreated, if they're untreated, that can lead to endothelial damage and set you up for all of those things I just mentioned, the cardiovascular disease, the risk of stroke, the cognitive decline. So that's what I want to avoid. So we need to treat vasomotor symptoms. And the way I think about it in terms of my patients is that uh, there's this rubric that I heard first from Joel Evans, and I've kind of developed it in my mind for the type of very deep testing and phenotyping I do with my patients. And that is, there's patients who have a red light when it comes to hormone therapy, starting in perimenopause or menopause. There's uh, women who have a yellow light, so they have some issues that we need to discuss and understand better. And then there's women who have a green light. And those are women who are very healthy. They've got a body mass index that's less than 24.9. They are good candidates, they're metabolically healthy. But most women are actually in that middle category, the yellow category. And right now, I think way too few physicians are treating the women that are in that yellow zone. So that's what we need to change. Can you tell I'm passionate about this? So I'm very excited about that. So Anna, is pregnenolone helpful to balance estrogen dominance? So that's an interesting question. Pregnenolone is the mother hormone of all the other hormones in the body. Look, I just happen to have a steroid pathway right here. Am I a nerd or what? So here's pregnenolone, should be at the top here. Where is it? Yeah, right here. So pregnenolone is right here. So it's, it's like the mother hormone that makes all the other hormones in the body. And so pregnenolone, what you want ideally is a level of about 100 in the body. So you measure that in the serum. And if you're low, I do advise taking pregnenolone. Now I think of it as kind of nurturing the mother. It's not gonna, it may not help you with estrogen dominance because when you have estrogen dominance, when you have too much usually estradiol compared to progesterone, 
it's like this. We want to balance the two. Pregnenolone may or may not do that. Often the reason for estrogen dominance, there's a lot of reasons that I go through in my book, The Hormone Cure, but one of them is that you're making too much cortisol. So pregnenolone can sometimes help with that, but unless you stop making so much cortisol, you may just increase the pregnenolone and it just goes into the cortisol pathway. So it's a little more complicated than that. Can endometriosis affect your endothelial cells? Eliza, you're just reading my mind here. So yes, in fact, endometriosis, let's talk about that a little bit. I just shot a video on endometriosis and just put a blog up on my website at saragoffreedmd.com. Does anyone read blogs anymore? I feel like, um, I feel like I post these blogs and I just don't even know if anyone's looking at them. But it's interesting. So endometriosis is actually a risk factor, kind of a non-traditional risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And I'm giving a talk at the American Academy for Anti-Aging Medicine in December on cardiovascular disease in women. So I've been looking at, at um, you know, there's five traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease, which you can probably rattle off. They're, you know, the hypertension, obesity, et cetera, smoking. Um, but there's 395 non-traditional risk factors that a lot of clinicians don't check for. And one of them is endometriosis. So yes, it absolutely affects your endothelial cells. We think of it as kind of a dysestrogenism state. Often women who have endometriosis have gut issues, even if they don't have gut symptoms, they have uh, a higher rate of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. So those are some of the things that you wanna be looking for. And I like to treat it with uh, supplements and sometimes with progesterone to try to balance out that dysestrogenism and estrogen dominance. So, oh, Julie does love blogs. I'm glad there's one person who still reads blogs. So I have a blog I'm about to post on vasomotor symptoms uh, based on all this new data from the North American Menopause Society. Should we talk about more things from the North American Menopause Society? Because I learned so many things. I have do you guys do this? I take like photos of the slides that I like. And so I have like 10,000 slides <laughs> that are pictured here that I took just from the past week. It's ridiculous. Like I can hardly keep track of them all, but um, I really enjoy this. And it's, there was one talk in particular by my old friend, Jan Schifrin, who's at Massachusetts General Hospital. She's a, a reproductive endocrinologist who's there. And I like the slide that she had, which had, you know, kind of the effect on the blood vessel when you treat, um, when you treat a younger woman, a woman who's in perimenopause, say age 50, versus treating an older woman who's got plaque. Oh, I just slid the, so an older woman who's got plaque and that's one of the reasons why it's better to treat sooner with menopausal hormone therapy. Better for the brain, uh, better for the uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. Lori has a folder of my slides. I am so honored. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. This is fun. I feel like I can read the comments a lot better than I can on Instagram. I think Instagram is designed for people who are like in their 20s and um oh michelle loves blogs too and reads mine thank you i appreciate that um yeah so i was saying at the beginning that my instagram got hacked about three weeks ago and so i've been off of instagram i was also finishing my fifth book so it was probably good that i got kicked off but it just means that I get to love you up over on Facebook again. So I'm really happy to be back. And I, it's nice to have this reminder that I can do a Facebook Live and actually can read the comments a lot more easily than I can on my teeny little phone where I'm trying to track comments. Okay. 
So what else can we talk about? I'm gonna give you like another couple of minutes and I just wanna make sure everybody knows about this Facebook Live that we're gonna do next Wednesday, October 14th. It'll be me with an amazing guy, Dr. Dan Monty, who is the chairman of the Department of Integrative Medicine and Nutritional Science at Thomas Jefferson University. So he's like a brother to me. I just really adore him. He's just such a good guy. And he just wrote a new book called Tapestry of Health. It's an amazing book. And so we're going to be talking about the book. We're going to be talking about glucose and insulin and weight loss and the quarantine 15 or the quarantine five or whatever it is that uh, you might have experienced. Let me know. I saw some of you posted how long you've been together with your partners and I'm amazed. So Lori, Alessandra, 13 years. Yeah, that's awesome. Megan, 25 years. Diane Jordan, 45 years. Oh my gosh, you win the prize. Renee Green, 25 years. Aaron, 24 years. That's so incredible. So incredible. You don't look old enough, but that's just so incredible. I just love it. Oh, so good. Okay, so I'm having a hard time saying goodbye. Let me say one other thing. So supplements, what supplements are you taking? I'm about to take some N-acetylcysteine and some pantothen pantothenic acid. So I just wanted to talk about these for a minute. So I find that pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5, is really helpful for those of us who are kind of aggro. Are you aggro? So I feel like I'm a recovering aggro person. I don't want to be aggro, but I still have some aggro tendencies. Like I work all the time because I kind of love it. Um, Julie, 25th wedding anniversary two months ago. Amazing. Deb, 31 years. I love it. Oh, that makes me so happy. So my wedding anniversary is October 19th. We're going to go to True Food because you can sit outside and you can eat clean food. And I'm very excited about that. So I'm taking my vitamin B5. I know this looks like a beer, but it's Topo Chico. I love Topo Chico. Big bubbles. Have you tried it? I love Topo Chico. And then N-acetylcysteine. So I'm a huge fan of N-acetylcysteine. I don't make enough glutathione. Do you know your glutathione level? So it's the master antioxidant in the body, and I just don't make enough of it. So I have one gene that is just like deleted. And um, thank you, Julie. Happy anniversary to you too. Um, next time I wanna hear more tips on lowering cholesterol, uh, cortisol, okay. So um, we could talk about that now. Uh, so one of the best things for lowering cortisol, I'll give you three different tips. You already know meditation is important. So I just started to change my meditation. Trish, 13 years, that's amazing. October 21st is my 20th wedding anniversary. Ah, oh, congratulations, Melinda, that's amazing. So, um, Phosphatidyl serine, PS, phosphatidyl serine. I'll type it in. PS, phosphatidyl serine. This has been shown in multiple randomized trials to lower cortisol. So if you have trouble sleeping, what I recommend is that you measure your cortisol level throughout the day, four times during the day. You can do a Dutch test, you can do a saliva cortisol test. So measure your um, cortisol level. And if the pattern is kind of flat with a high cortisol before you go to bed, take phosphatidylserine before you go to bed. It'll help with that high cortisol. The other thing is fish oil. So I'm a big fan of balanced omegas. So I like fish oil with the EPA and the DHA. I take four grams of that a day because I've got a lot of Alzheimer's in my family. I take that with specialized pro-resolving mediators. Maybe we can talk more about that next Wednesday. And uh, fish oil has been shown to lower cortisol. Two to four grams a day, it also helps with weight loss. Helps with insulin sensitivity. So get, if you have Alzheimer's in your family, take four grams. Uh, the third thing that helps with cortisol levels 
Well, I mentioned meditation, I mentioned phosphatidylserine, and I mentioned fish oil. There's many other things too. I like rhodiola. It's a little stimulating for some people, but that's one of the herbals that I like, rhodiola. So hopefully you got lots of tips here. Christina wants to know what brand of fish oil. So I have a fish oil that I formulated that's over at reset360.com, but there's lots of different brands. I tend to like the ones that have a uh, really good GMP, good quality control. So I tend to use um, Metagenics, Designs for Health, Thorn. Those are kind of my three go-to. A lot of them you can get on Amazon as well. Unfortunately, the vegan omegas are not as well proven. Although the, the omegas that are from algae are a little better than uh, some of the others. So, you know, most of the data is biased toward fish oil. And I try to talk my vegans into maybe considering a little bit of fish oil because we know, you know, there's not a, one diet that fits all, but a pescatarian diet is probably the healthiest. If you, if you look at, you know, levels of inflammation, if you look at longevity, if you look at muscle mass, that's probably the best. And so I, I try to have that conversation if my vegan patients are open to it. So Karen, hi from Oregon. Jenny takes good genes. That's great, Jenny, very happy. Okay, Nick, why not melatonin? So I'm a big fan of melatonin. Here's my favorite new fact about melatonin. Yes, it certainly helps with the sleep-wake cycle. No question, it helps with jet lag. Um, it also helps with the blood-brain barrier, which we all know gets a little thinner as we get older, right? You have a glass of wine, it just hits you a lot harder than it used to. So melatonin helps with the blood-brain barrier. I used to be a fan of just small doses of melatonin. So I, I really like the microdosing that you could do, you know, 0.3 to 0.4 milligrams, uh, three to four hours before you go to bed so that as it starts to decline, the body makes more melatonin in response. But now I'm a fan of taking higher doses based on the latest literature. So I'm gonna take my N-acetylcysteine as kind of a closing thought here because I need to go see my amazing hot husband who's downstairs and wants dinner. So thanks everybody. Really happy to be with you. Come back on October 14th. That's next Wednesday at noon Pacific. 3 p.m. Eastern. I'll be here with Dan Monty. And feel free to ask more questions. Let me know what you want to hear about next Wednesday, and I'll be doing some future lives with you. I really appreciate you being with me. Okay, have a good night, everyone.